Bonjour and welcome on the Gospel Spice podcast, where you are invited to taste and see that the Lord is good. Gospel Spice is your Christ-centered podcast infused with in-depth biblical flavors and sprinkled with a dash of French culture to spice up your relationship with God. Here is your host, Stephanie Roussel, with a guest today. Today, I'm having a really insightful conversation with Pastor Daniel Im. He's the lead pastor at the Beulah Alliance Church in Edmonton, Alberta. He's originally Korean, so we're going to talk about some kimchi and other fun things. He's the author of several books, and we're going to discuss his latest book called The Discipleship Opportunity, Leading a Great Commission Church in a Post-Everything World. Now, the book, The Discipleship Opportunity, is initially written for pastors and church leaders, but as a lay leader myself. I've totally enjoyed reading it, and I think you will too. It's about equipping and empowering us to lead and evangelize and disciple and preach, for those of us who are called to that, differently in a post-pandemic, post-truth, post-Christian, post-everything planet. So Daniel is joining us today to debunk outdated assumptions, and we're going to look together at the four types of people in our community that he describes in the book. The sleepers, the seekers, the consumers, and the disciples. Then he he unpacks in the book and with us how to understand, reach them with relevancy and passion so that more people will come to know Jesus deeply and to be known by him, which, as you know, is so important for us here on the Gospel Spice podcast. So he helps us identify them, those four categories, sleepers, seekers, consumers, and disciples, and then reach them in order to grow them towards a deeper passion for Christ. So it's about following Jesus to the ends of the earth, even if the ends of the earth are in our own families or in our own neighborhoods. Also, we are giving away three copies. All you need to do is to be signed up to our newsletter in order to receive the email we'll send in a handful of days so that you can enter for a chance to win one of three copies. So make sure you're signed up. So Pastor Daniel M, welcome on the Gospel Spice podcast today. Well, it's so great to be with you, Stephanie. You are Canadian. I love that. I don't get to interview Canadians. You were telling me before we started that you learned a bit of French in school before, just a few years ago, right? <laughs> That's right. So it was one of those things where my grade in French was fantastic in grade eight. Uh, but with all the conjugation of verbs and all of that, and just it getting more and more complex every single year, I think my level of French peaked at grade eight. And in grade nine, it was the same level. And I went from A to a B, B to a B minus, D plus, and I kind of went down. But I did live in Montreal for a couple of years. So my French is okay. I understand more than I can speak. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. Yes, those French conjugations. I'm so sorry. Yeah, they really are not for the yes. faint of heart. I'm so sorry. <laughs> do you know, I mean, yeah. even, even the French, we know that. Like we literally have timed spelling tests <laughs> all the way through you know, high school, 12th grade. Yeah. It's, it's pretty crazy. Yeah, yeah. I don't know. It's there's no joke. We homeschooled our kids partly in French because I didn't want them to not have French. I mean, come on, you know, my family <laughs> totally. doesn't, my family of origin doesn't speak English. What am I going to do? Raise kids who yes. don't speak French. But of course. It's hard. They, they still, they still oh, struggle yeah. with the conjugations, even as adults. So there you yeah. go. <laughs> well, particularly because some verbs have, you know, that some conjugations are very apparent and it makes ton of sense. And then others are like, how is this related to that word in any way? But I get that. English, I speak Korean fluently, and there's there's still the same nuances, really, with so many languages, right? Right. <laughs> and, and I love, however, I mean, yes, I agree. I mean, sometimes there's words you're like, how is this at all connected to anything? But sometimes we get that... Um, I love what you just said, the fact that you are immersed in so many different cultures, maybe not the French so much, but Americans, North American, uh, Korean. Isn't that interesting? Like how, and, and that's the question, you know, that I wasn't planning on asking, but how have you discovered that being immersed in so many different cultures, how has that helped you maybe understand yourself, understand the cultures you're living mm. in, understand and maybe even approach scripture? Yeah, no, that's that's a great question. Because in adolescent development, one of the things that is such an important uh, milestone for any human being, right, particularly teenagers, I have two at home, uh, 14, 13, and a nine-year-old. And, and, and I know in formerly being a youth pastor a while ago, just understanding the sense that being able to put yourself in someone else's shoes 
Like that is such a key competency that'll move someone from an adolescent to an adult. And it's one of those things that sadly speaking, many adults still don't know how to do. Being able to put yourself in someone else's shoes, know what it feels like to not be in the majority, but to be in the minority. Know what it feels like to live in the in-between and to be okay living in that liminality and that in-between. So for me, I, I, I feel like it's, I wouldn't say it's a, I wouldn't call it a superpower, but it's sort of a superpower in growing up as a Korean, actually having to do ESL in kindergarten because all I knew how to speak and 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 hear was Korean because my parents didn't have being immigrants coming from Korea moving in Canada they didn't want their kids to not know Korean and 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 growing up wanting to play hockey wanting to eat burgers but then also wanting to put kimchi on my spaghetti and no one else doing that and they're like why would you what is that my husband would love you for this He loves yeah. kimchi. He just puts it on everything too. And he's absolutely not Korean. He's actually I African. So there you go. I mean, keep talking <laughs> about cultures, go. right? Like just this total, this yeah. African guy eating kimchi in America, right? And so yeah. you can Married relate to, to a that. French lady. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> I love that. And isn't that, isn't that a beautiful picture of the kingdom of God, right? Isn't that a beautiful picture, not only of human development, but spiritual development too, being able to know, hey, my experience is not going to be your experience. And for us to then not go the extra step and say something like you be you, because that phrase as popular as it is, is so flawed. And, and we can break that down and how flawed it is and how anti-biblical it is as well, and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But it's just one of those like, culturally oh yeah you be you sort of thing but it's not actually something that will 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 help us live into a kingdom vision and and grow as spiritually mature individuals so i i think those are probably a a couple of those pieces, but yeah. <laughs> I love what you just said, the UBU thing as just kind of the tip of the iceberg of how um that's what we're going to talk about. How in your book what you're doing is that you're trying to move away from a lot of the cliched ways of mm. doing things as mm -hmm. Christians, as believers, and you're trying to um, wake us up, like give us a good shake. Yeah. Uh, maybe put some kimchi on our American food a little bit <laughs> and say, that. hey, you know, let's wake up your taste buds here and let's consider if maybe some of the models we've been following in the past don't work at all anymore. Maybe they've worked, maybe they were flawed from the beginning, yes. like the UBU sentence. So that's kind of what you're doing. And that's what I want us to talk about. Um, speaking of kimchi, like what's your favorite kind and what spices go into kimchi? I mean, this oh, is gospel man. spices. Yes. Yes. So in Korean cooking, uh, red, there, there's basically three major ingredients. Uh, you got the red pepper chili. So it mm -hmm. can be moved. You can, there's the flakes. It can be made into a paste. Essentially, anything kimchi is likely going to have red pepper chili. And then you have soy sauce and you have sesame seed oil. So essentially, in everything that you eat that's Korean, it'll have some measure of mix, which is very sad for those with sesame allergies. Uh, so, because avocado oil is just not the same thing as sesame oil, <laughs> yeah, with the flavor, with the fragrance, and all of that. So, uh, having said all that, uh, it's probably that my taste buds are numb or or destroyed with all the spice that I've eaten throughout my life. So, the spicier, the better for me. Okay, so there you go. That's a good point too. Is that you know here we like to promote the spice of the gospel because there's not too much, not too so no such thing as too much of the spice of the gospel, but there's value in balancing it too in in yes. taking it in properly because uh, those red chili pepper flakes man they can burn your tongue something fierce <laughs> yes and you need more and more for it to taste better as you as, yeah. okay so we're talking about uh you know dead taste buds and stuff but really there's we're, we're going somewhere with this you and your book with one of my favorites maybe analogies of the many you have in the book you talk about um a volcano eruption which is kind of like an overload of spiritual spice right like in some mm -hmm. ways you could say okay there was this volcano eruption too much spice all at once and it deadened your taste buds and in this case it led in 196 in 1816 to a year without a summer How is that something we're still maybe experiencing four years into after COVID? 
And what does that have to do with understanding, uh, giving us a framework for the culture we're living in today? Yeah, yeah, completely. I remember I was speaking at a conference the week that the pandemic happened and the week that all the shutdowns were happening. We had just moved back to Canada from Nashville and I, we had moved back for me to be the next lead pastor at this 102-year-old church. Well, at that point, it, it, was, it was 99 years old. So, and, and I, was, I was coming back to, to follow a 30-year senior pastor in this church, a legacy pastor, much beloved, hugely respected. So we're coming back. And, and at that moment, I'm traveling because my last book had come out and I was speaking on it. And life was as we knew it before, quote-unquote, normal. And I remember coming back to Canada the week that everything was shutting down and just having the question of what in the world does this mean, right? My wife has gotten toilet paper. She is getting us all ready. I'm sitting in meetings wondering, do I need to be on quarantine? Do our staff? When's the cutoff date? And then I come across this article by Andy Crouch where he talks about the year without the summer, a year without summer, this idea of, okay, are we moving into a blizzard? Is, is this, is everything that's happening a winter, uh, which we know a lot about in Edmonton where six months of the year is winter. Uh, or is you this still have going snow to... <laughs> right now? <laughs> no, no, no. It's all, it's all melted now. It's, it's all nice it's, and good. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. It's great. It's green. It's beautiful. Or, right, or is this a blizzard? Is this a winter? Or is this going to be a little ice age? Are we going to have a year without summer? And I remember him talking about this analogy. And I was just enamored by this notion that a volcano on the other side of the world could have such long-lasting, devastating effects. And, and I know with globalization, social media, all of that, we are so interconnected from an ideological, philosophical trend sort of way, cultural, even fashion, you see that too. But to think that a natural disaster on the other side of the world wouldn't just affect that week or that new cycle or that month, but an entire year, in the years to come in affecting the global temperature to the point where there was there was there was you know droughts and floods and 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 all of these pieces where snow in the summer like all these abnormal meteorological things would happen on the other side of the world not just locally but on the other side of the world started to make me think okay so so in 2024 right? Or in 2025 or in any of the years to come, are we actually still living out the effects, not only of the pandemic, but everything that had been leading up to that in the, in the UBU sort of philosophy, right? In this idea of, oh, we live in a post-truth culture or in a post-Christian culture. Yes, we're post- pandemic but oh there's so many other post everything sort of world that we're living in so that's the piece where for me as a student of culture and as a student of the scriptures there's just that sense of yeah what are we allowing into our lives what are we believing what assumptions are we living our lives based off of where if someone were to call it out it's like, oh, wait, I don't believe that. Yeah, but you actually just made all these decisions in light of that framework. As I like to say, fish don't know what water is. Uh, you 100%. you have to, it has to be pointed out to you sometimes. And again, we're talking about, you know, being immersed in different cultures. That's how you realize your own culture is when you're taken out of it or where yes. it's being emphasized by different ways of doing things. So um, how would you say maybe then that, that the culture has evolved maybe as a result of COVID or maybe how has COVID more revealed what was more underlying? Mm -hmm. So what's fascinating, and this is some recent research that's been coming out about Generation Z and Generation Alpha. And what they're noticing is this sense that there's a greater, and, and I'm seeing this not only in those generations, it's 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 magnified in those generations, but I'm seeing it among millennials, Gen X, boomers, etc., where we're actually seeing a greater measure of spiritual openness than I've ever seen before. And and I'll give you an example. I in university, I got my undergrad. I started off in sciences. I was moving toward a pre-med track, and then I discerned a call to 
vocational pastoral ministry. So I ended up getting a BA in religious studies. So not in a Bible college, nothing Christian, really. It's just broadly philosophy and religious studies. And I remember studying these sociologists and uh, Peter Berger, for example, and and a lot of these people who would be predicting, hey, the world's going to just become more and more anti-religion, anti, you know, atheism is going to continue to grow. And there are all of these these great predictions of our world to say, yeah, God is dead. Uh, Richard Dawkins, you know, you have all this sense where, yeah, there's atheism, there's e- an irrelevance to the to Christianity, to faith, to all of this. And then you emerge, and then you enter into a global phenomenon, a global pandemic that affected so many people in so many different ways. Um, all the way through misinformation, all the way through death, all the way, you know, all every way, which way that this happened. And we emerge out of this recognizing and feeling, hey, actually, there's stuff that has happened that I can't explain. There are things going in my on in my life that I used to build my life based off of this belief and it doesn't work anymore. Or I am more lonelier than I've ever been. And there are these questions of the soul, right? There are these questions of, of discontent with our culture's promise of wealth, our culture's promise of materialism, of consumer, all of these things that we had been just naturally, oh, of course the stock market's going to go up into the right. Of course, of course I'm going to buy Bitcoin and, and crypto because now I've made a hundred times the amount and it all comes crashing. And there's this sense where I believe God is using the circumstances of our world today to reveal that, wait, what we, the promises we've built our life upon don't actually last. And people are hungering for answers and they're recognizing that there is more to life than this. And they're turning to spirituality, may or may not be Christianity, but they're turning to spirituality and they're not saying God is dead. They're not saying that, that there is no, they're, they're saying, yes, there is. There are connections, there are things that are happening. What is it? And churches that are coming and unapologetically saying, hey, here's Jesus. Look at what Jesus did. Jesus said, you've heard it was said, but now I say to you, right? Jesus showed us who God is in the flesh. And churches that are proclaiming that and are showing the world that, yeah, there is an answer and his name is Jesus. I'm finding such transformation in and through those churches and in contexts like ours. So really what you're saying is really, really good news because we've heard it so much, like you were saying, that uh, people are not interested in spiritual matters, but that's just simply not true. And Mm. in that sense, you know, maybe COVID is something we can actually be grateful for to some extent. Maybe it's... Mm -hmm. Uh, it has been, uh, it has had a cathartic effect in that sense. So, but not everyone is. So what yes. you're doing, what I loved in your book is that you are providing us with a very simple way to, as Christians, to, as, as what you call disciples, uh, people who are really devoted to being followers of Christ and are making disciples themselves. Um, you provide us with a framework that helps us understand the world as it is today. So yes. that when we are in relationship with someone, you help us kind of decipher where they are on that spiritual spectrum so that we can have tangible tools. You have very practical how-to sections in your book for each category of people so that we can uh, apply the right tools to the right profile of person we get to interact with. And I didn't say share the gospel with because that's a consequence after the building of much relationship that you go into. So yes. um, yep. tell us about uh, maybe let's start. So the people you described, I think so far uh, who are spiritually sensitive, but maybe not Christians, you would call them seekers, yeah, but not yeah. everyone is a seeker. So yeah. tell us about what you call the disinterested in general. Maybe yeah. to start. Yeah, yeah. So that was a, it was a huge insight as I was trying to lead a local church through a pandemic and, and myself and my family and just my relationships, some that strengthened others that didn't and, and all of the loss and the grief. At the same time, my dad passed from cancer and, you know, the loss of COVID, the loss of my dad, the loss of normal, the loss of, and it's just all of this loss 
And what I noticed was the people in our church, the people in our communities, it wasn't as linear or as, 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 as simple as saying, hey, some don't follow Christ and some do. Because among those who were disciples of Jesus, Christians, and among those who wouldn't follow God, I found that there was this other category, which is what I present in the book, that there are those who are actually interested and those who are uninterested, right? So starting with this, this category of seeker, I'll, I'll, I'll give you an example of, of, of someone who was a sleeper, right? Who, 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 would, who I would call uninterested non-Christians and how they moved from being a sleeper to being a seeker who would then move from uninterest to interest, and and I'm not going to share the guy's name, but he came to our church a couple months ago, and, and he had moved to Edmonton from Toronto um, last year. He had not been in a church or in any sort of uh, no no relationship with God. He had grown up Catholic, but really it had been over two decades since he had ever gone to any sort of anything religious or Christian in any sense or fashion. Well, things are going on in his life. So he would be in that sleeper category because he's uninterested. Gets in, right? Does like he doesn't, he wouldn't even know anyone that's a Christian, right? He's a sleeper. Well, things are going on in his life. Stuff is happening. Uh, there's a stirring. And what we know is is God is always calling us back to himself. Jesus left the 99 and would pursue the one. And, and we know that Jesus is pursuing every single person. And, and he's pursuing him and stuff's going on in his life. And he wakes up and he's like, I think I need to go to a church. So he Googles Catholic churches near me because he had gone to a Catholic school and, and that's what he knew. He Googles Catholic churches near me and Beulah Alliance Church, which is the name of the church that I, I, I have the privilege of serving at. Beulah Alliance Church is the number one search result on Google. Huh. Okay. And and just for all the skeptics out there, don't worry, we're not using SEO, SEM. There's no paid advertising. There's no keywording that we're doing to target Catholics or anything. There's nothing. There's nothing like that. We tried to redo this search. We tried on multiple devices. Like there's it doesn't work. It doesn't come up. How in the world can you explain that Beulah would be the number one search result? It's God. Right, like, like there, there's no other explanation. Like, and then it's like, wait, God works through Google. Hey, God can work through any way that He wants to work. Come on, He uses donkey. <laughs> he can use Google. Exactly, exactly. But what we know from that is, is what we are seeing in our world today, is that God is pursuing us, and in ways that we might have often heard that God would work in the Middle East or in the 1040 window, or in the underground church in China, or among the persecuted church, I'm seeing God work in those same ways in the West, in our context that is now post-Christian, and in some contexts moving even beyond to pre-Christian. And there's this sense where God is moving, and He is stirring and moving sleepers to seekers. He's waking people up. He's waking people up, and I believe it's our responsibility as Christians to then have the relationships, love our neighbors and those around us like Jesus does, not with a hidden agenda, but love them, pray for them, and be in those relationships so that when the Holy Spirit wakes them up, stirs their hearts, they're like, oh, wait, uh, Stephanie seems different. I let me let me ask her about this. And that's how those come and God uses those relationships in that way. So that's that's the huge thing. Whereas previously I I I felt like it was what was communicated in the church, what was communicated in Christian circles was it's our responsibility to interest people in the gospel. It was our responsibility to change people's minds and hearts. And apologetics, I'm not I'm not bashing apologetics because it's very helpful. But really, today, it's only helpful among those who are already interested. I'm a big fan of apologetics for seekers and for you know yes. the other categories that you described. But for the ones you call sleepers, of course, that's not going to work because they're no. not even at that level of interest. Exactly. Uh, and I love what you just said, how it's the Holy Spirit who wakes them up. It's not mm -hmm. us. 
Yes. We can't just, you know, you want to, God knows, like to this day, all of my family, I grew up atheist in France, you know, pretty classic. And uh, all of my Mm -hmm. family of origin, including, you know, my mother, who's literally in the next room visiting from France as I'm recording this, she is totally averse to anything Christian. She's completely a sleeper, what you would describe Mm -hmm. a sleeper. So she and I can't have spiritual conversations, but there's other tools. So um, for those of us who have sleepers in our families, in our, in our, in in our, probably not in our churches, most likely not, but Mm -hmm. Yeah, not anymore. Uh, yeah, not anymore. Right. In our neighborhoods, uh, <laughs> yeah. you know, you describe what a sleeper is. And I know it's so comforting for me to read this and to go, yeah, that's why I can't talk to my mom about spiritual things is because she's completely asleep spiritually. So yeah. what can I do? What can we do when we have sleepers? And then I want us to move on to the other categories because I find this so insightful. And by the way, I'm sorry, I'm going to let you talk, I promise. But uh, this book, even though you write it initially for pastors and church leaders, as a lay person, uh, even though I have worked in the church before, um, I find this really interesting. So it's not just for pastors and church leaders it's for anyone Mm -hmm. who has a desire to understand the world we live in in 2024 so uh, tell us about how to talk to the sleepers how am i supposed to talk to my mom yeah i love that i love that uh so what you shouldn't do is grab pots and pens and and bang it to try to wake them up if they're asleep and saying, wake up. I can't believe you can't see what's going on. No, don't do that. Right. Because if you've ever been woken up in that way, or and it's a, it talks about it in the Proverbs too, right? If you ever are waking up too harshly or too loudly or anything, like that, it doesn't work. Right. It doesn't work. You just get grumpy. And I get that. I get grumpy too. So instead of doing that, what we need to first and foremost understand is that God loves the sleepers in your life more than you ever could. God knows the number of hairs on their head. God created them and God is choosing to sustain them by giving the giving them the breath in their lungs. So if God is still actively sustaining them, it means he's still pursuing them. And if we start with that understanding and we don't carry false shame and guilt that had been communicated in the past, uh, and, and I'm not going to name any names, but there's, there, there is definitely a trend in church circles to say, hey, if you're, you may be the only Christian that this non-Christian knows. So if you don't share the gospel with them and they die and go to hell, it's on you. I get the heart behind that. I do. Because yes, there's a great commission and there's a lost world and we need to take it seriously. I, I understand fully the heart behind that, but un- unintentionally and unfortunately that's placed too much shame and guilt and burden on us that we were never designed to carry. So having said that, if God loves the sleepers in our lives more than we ever could, then what does it look like for us to play the long game? Right. It's, it, I mean, it feels better, doesn't it? Like there's a sense of, oh, okay, okay, it's not on me. God is pursuing them. So then, how do we play the long game where we don't think that our every interaction is going to be our last interaction? How do we join God in what he's doing in their life? How do we take prayer seriously? And, 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 and petition and pray and pray bold prayers. I'm not just saying pray, pray, pray light prayers like, God, would you save them? I'm praying, God, would you wreck them? And it's hard sometimes to pray that for people that we love. But to pray bold and courageous prayers like, God, would you wreck them? Would you show them that the way that they are living does not work? Would you, would you begin uh, allowing the, the foundation that they've built on to begin crumbling? Would you allow sinkholes to appear? Would you let them fall into sinkholes? But would you do it graciously? God, would you do it mercifully? Lord, would you do it in a loving way? Right, you know what I'm talking. It's this balance, right? We're not. I'm not saying let's curse. That's not what we're talking about, right? We're 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 speaking life. We love the sleepers in our lives, right? But we're gonna pray these bold prayers, and then we are going to ensure that we have the margin in our lives 
to have friendships with them. And here's the key thing, and this is from a research project that the Billy Graham Center and Lifeway Research did together. And, and, and they did it a few years back where they, where they surveyed 2,000 non-Christians about Christians, right? This, these weren't 2,000 Christians about non-Christians. They surveyed 2,000 non-Christians about the Christians in their lives. And here's what was fascinating about that research. More than 70% of these non-Christians, people that would not follow God, would not have faith in Jesus, more than 70% said that they would have a spiritual conversation. They would enjoy and be open to having a spiritual conversation with their Christian friends, if they were friends. (laughs) That they wouldn't be open to the street evangelist that they have no relationship with but they'd be open to having this with the friends in their life. So I guess that's the question. Are you friends with the sleepers in your life? I'm not asking if you know the color of their car before they drive into their driveway and their garage and they shut that door, right? I'm not asking if you know their names. I'm asking if you're friends with them. I'm not asking if they've come into your house because you've invited them. I'm asking if they've invited you into their house Right? Have you been invited into the the the, the non Christian friends, um, the the their houses in your life? Like, have you been invited out by them, or are you the only one inviting them? Because if you're truly friends, it's gonna go both ways. Right? Are you not only asking to help them? Are they asking you for help too? Right? That's what friendship looks like. And I think that's the key thing that we need to do. We know the Holy Spirit's pursuing them. We know that God loves them. We know that that's happening. But God wants to use not only the supernatural, but he wants to use the Christians in their lives. He wants to use us to love them, to care for them, to be there, and to then share the gospel, both in word and in deed. And as you grow in friendship with them, then you get the privilege of introducing them to your Christian friends. So then yes. you're not the only one, quote unquote, to have to share the gospel with them because all yeah. of a sudden they find themselves within the context of a Christian community as yeah. a non-Christian. And that can be quite compelling. And that's so important because in a, in a world where in decades ago where where there's a general sense of sin there's a general sense of 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 right and wrong there is a general sense of truth there's right where the whole ubu thing is underneath it is there is no truth uh your truth is your truth my truth is my truth is all internal it's not external so in a world like that today um evangelism cannot be me to my non-christian friends it has it can't be a one to one thing it has to be a community oriented thing because it's too easy in a ubu world where wow stephanie you're so kind stephanie you're so nice stephanie you're so caring it's too easy and 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 oh and you're christian but it's but it's too easy for our neighbors and our non christian friends in our lives to just chalk it up to stephanie to chalk it up to oh, that's just Daniel and Christina. Just chalk it up to and not have it to do anything with Christians because in our world's eyes, many Christians are hypocrites. Many Christians are, you know, and you go down the list. But all of a sudden, if it's like, wait, 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 Stephanie's Christian and she's like that. Well, Daniel's Christian and he's like Christina's like, oh, and they're and and they start naming off and, and they're like, wait, you're all Christian? And yeah. and you're not you're not all bigots, and you're not all Bible Bible thumpers, and you're not yeah. all yeah. right. And and it and it starts breaking it down. And that's the plausible deniability theory and all that, right? And and that's the piece where it's just so yeah. important yeah. around neighboring. Again, you know, you're listening, you're watching this right now. I hope you're you're picking up the fact that what Daniel does is that he breaks down the profiles of the people we have in our lives, and he helps us 
identify them, understand them, relate to them. And then, Daniel, you give us really good tools. So I know we're running out of time. We've mentioned the sleepers that we're hopefully going to turn into seekers by God's grace once he wakes them up. And they're going to start seeking like this man who found you as your his number one Catholic church choice, <laughs> which was pretty awesome. And then the other category I find interesting is of the non-interested, you've got the, the sleepers who are not Christians, but then you've got people who are Christians and who are absolutely, in many ways, just as uninterested as the sleepers. Yes. And these people are among us in the churches quite a bit. So tell us about them, the consumers, yeah. uh, so that we can identify them and and briefly, yeah, maybe just identifying them for starters. Yeah, 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 yeah totally. So, so on the Christian side of things, the uninterested are consumers and the interested are disciples. Oh, my goodness consumerism we we live in such a consumeristic society that that for disciples it's so easy to slip into consumeristic tendencies and for consumers there is a sense of okay yes i they will see themselves as disciples in many respects but perhaps their practices their behaviors everything is actually so heavily consumeristic that they may or may not realize this okay so here's a verb that I heard being used, reference to our relationship with God, reference to church, that in the scriptures, this verb is never used. Like, this is not a verb that we should ever use as it relates to our relationship with God. And it's watch. When the pandemic happened, I heard so many Christians talk about watching church watching yeah and i and i get it restrictions buildings you know they're all, we don't want to talk about all that stuff anymore right well but, for a few months okay <laughs> but not like three years into it no but it's still i hear it it's like i, I I'm, I'm watching what did jesus ever say come and watch no he said come and die right it's and and it's worship not watch but unintentionally this consumeristic the, the consumeristic world that we're living in, even the fact that the guy Googled, right, that, that previous example, Googled um, Catholic churches near me, he found Beulah. And you know what? Uh, if, if you've never Googled your church, uh, do so and look at the reviews. It's, it's both can be very encouraging and horrendous at, um, on both ways because we live in a consumeristic society. So when it comes to our faith as individuals, not necessarily only as churches or as pastors or as church leaders, but as individuals, I think we need to check ourselves and we need to look and, 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 and audit the language we're using. Are, do we refer to our church as your church? Because I've heard people call our church your church to me. And I'm like, wait, 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 wait a second. My church? Like, isn't this your church? Like, aren't we the church? this is what's going on here. And to check ourselves, are we using verbs like, like, like watch as it relates to our relationship with God? Are we, are we talking about the church as your church? Are we going with a mindset and a posture to, to corporate worship from a, what am I going to receive or actually, or are we actually going to give? All right. When it comes to discipleship, at Beulah, we talk about a disciple of Jesus is someone who gathers, grows, gives, and goes together with others. And we use those four verbs very intentionally because consumers are okay with gathering and growing. All right, that's like if you're working out, that's that's the stuff that if you if you've never worked out and you want to work out, that's that's like your upper body, right? That's that's your arms, that's your shoulders, that's your chest, that's the stuff that people see, and that's that's what's often easiest and where we often start. That's the gathering and growing. But boy, if you want to work, if you want to be healthy as an individual, if you want to be fit, you need to work on your abs. Like you cannot ignore your core because if you ignore your core, you're going to have back problems. If you ignore your core, you're going to wake up and this is adulting, right? You're going to wake up and you're going to have a back injury, not because you lifted anything, 
but because you slept wrong, <laughs> right? Anyone else experience? That? Yes. Right. Oh, yes. yeah. Right. And that's, I'm there that's with just, you. <laughs> oh, totally. Right. And that is part of growing up, unfortunately. But it's also it's 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 symptomatic of of core not having a strong enough core as well. It's related in that way. And and what is working out our core spiritually? It's mm-hmm. giving, right? It's giving of our tithes of our time, of our talents, of our treasures. It's giving financially. It's giving of our time. It's giving of all this, which consumers don't want to do, right? Because consumers are going to get. It's a transaction. I'm giving to get or I'm going to get. And it's all spirituality is a transaction. And it's like, no, 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 actually, God, God calls us to give of our entire selves. Your life is a, your body is a living sacrifice Right. So there's this aspect of giving. And then there's the legs, right? The other thing that people don't like working out on squatting. I hate squats. I hate lunges. I hate all that stuff. But if we don't work out on our legs, how imbalanced are we going to be? And that's mm-hmm. the going. And that's another thing that consumers don't want to do. They don't want to go. They don't want to, to build relationships with the sleepers in their life. They don't want to go. They want to pay yeah. someone else to go. Yeah. <laughs> Yes. Right. It's all transactional. So Mm -hmm. what does it look like for us individually to ensure and to make sure that, hey, my discipleship to Jesus, have I unintentionally slipped into consumeristic relationship with him? Where I unintentionally have actually switched churches because I didn't get what I needed? Oh, whoa, that's dangerous. Oh, wait a second. Did I did I actually delegate my feeding to the pastor? Actually, when you think about shepherding, the only time the shepherd actually feeds the sheep is when sheep are injured or sick. That's the only time shepherds hand feed sheep. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Why have I put the pastor in a pedestal on a pedestal? And why do I expect him to feed me? No, actually, the shepherd's responsibility is to bring me into a field where I can feed myself. Yes, there is a responsibility of feeding, but I need to actually feed myself. Wait, are you calling me sick, Daniel? Are you calling me? Are you calling me injured? Well, at a point, and to a point, yes, there are moments where, yeah, we do need to be hand fed, but maturing and growing as a disciple of Jesus is actually learning how to feed ourselves. And moving out of that consumeristic mindset. So I share all that not to like shame and guilt anyone listening and not to say, because I've been there so many times. I've sat around a table and judged the pastor's sermon before. And, you know, I've done all that before. I was like, oh, I don't like that music. That person didn't sing good. And I've, I've done all that before. But as I grow in my relationship with God, part of maturing spiritually is is exterminating <laughs> the consumeristic tendencies out of our lives. As we end, one one quote I'm I took out of uh, the many nuggets of wisdom you have in the book is that as a pastor you preach to equip in order to offer a meal kit. So mm. I love your analogy with HelloFresh and other you know meal delivery services. I mean, again, this is gospel spice, but uh, that's what you're saying. Like when we receive a meal kit to our door, it's like receiving the tools we need to go out to pasture and feed ourselves. And that's the role of the disciples in the church, the ones who are really walking in the fullness of their calling. But that's also the role of the church leaders. They're not to feed us, they're to give us a meal kit so that we can feed ourselves Monday through Saturday, even if we're there to be fed in some ways on Sundays. And it, and it repeats and it repeats, right? Not just so that the pastor offers the meal kit to the disciple, but so that then the disciple can, and it's not just so that you can learn how to cook via meal kits, right? The ultimate yeah. goal is that you can cook f- with any spice, with raw ingredients, and that you can then teach someone else how to do that, right? <laughs> exactly. It's a teaching tool. Hopefully those meal kits are a teaching tool. Yes. And it's a step up from, you know, takeout. Yes, basically. 100%. <laughs> Which is what consumers would do. Consumers yeah. would take takeout. It's all takeout, 100%. Final question. And I'm going to ask you to keep that your answer brief, but it's absolutely key. And you actually start the book with that. Why can church growth be the wrong goal? Mm. In light of everything we've said. Yeah. 
Can you yeah. do that in a couple of minutes? I know it's like literally the first half of the book and we haven't touched on that. But... Yeah. Okay. I'll, 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 I'll share two statements and try to wrap it up. Number one, in the West, we are obsessed with growth, right? Mm -hmm. We want our stocks to grow. We want our investments to grow. We want our kids to grow. We want our marriage to grow. Like everything, we are obsessed with growth and we want everything to be up and to the right. Two, opposite statement, 70 years ago, there's a statement said that a shrinking church is a sinning church. A shrinking church is a sinning church. That is not true. But that was a statement that was said and that for the next 70 years, our churches and church practice was heavily shaped and influenced by that trend, by that statement, and by the philosophy that was built up on that. So with that being said, if we believe growth is our responsibility and we don't grow, and if things are all, aren't always up and to the right, either individually in our relationship with God or, or within the church, we unintentionally feel shame and we feel guilt and we think it's our fault. But if you look at 1 Corinthians 3, what you read is, hey, it's Paul and Apollos that plant and water the seeds. You and I plant and water seeds but God is the one who causes growth. So for all the pastors and church leaders listening in, your responsibility isn't to grow your church. Your responsibility is to be faithful, to plant seeds, to water them, to preach the word, to uphold how truthful and life transforming the word of God is, not to teach your philosophies, but to teach the word of God. That's your responsibility to plant and water. But as individuals, our responsibility is also planting and watering which isn't, I'm going to check off my time with God and I'm done. I should grow, shouldn't I? No, it's actually our responsibility is to be with God, to see our relationship with God, not as a transactional. I read the Bible and I prayed. I did this spiritual, this one. No, no, no. No, actually just spend time with God, linger, cultivate a relationship with God. And whether growth happens or not, so here's, uh, can I just share one last story? It'll be really quick. My preaching coach, Steve Carter, I love what he said. Uh, he talked to a rabbi in Jerusalem and he asked this rabbi, um, how much time in the Bible, there's this idea of uh, Egypt, living in Egypt. There's this idea of living in the wilderness and this idea of living in the promised land. And he asked this rabbi, how much time do we spend in each? And the rabbi responded, oh, you Americans, oh, you Westerners, all you want to do is live in the promised land, right? It's our obsession for growth. And he's like, actually, 10 to 15% of our lives is lived in Egypt. 10 to 15% of our lives is lived in the promised land. And 70 to 80% is in the wilderness. <sighs> <laughs> right? What does it look like for us to actually realize that the wilderness, that the in-between, that the going from one to another is actually the majority of our lives? And that sometimes waiting and trusting is more uh, of, of, of our of, of, is more of what our life is going to look like than all of the fruit. So <laughs> that's so good. That was not in your book. No, I it wasn't. Remember. It wasn't. Yeah, it's, <laughs> Maybe it's in another book or it should be because yeah. that's really good. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, thank you so much. I feel so inspired and I'm sure that it has given much food for thought to everyone listening or watching. So Pastor Daniel M., would you mind closing by praying for those who are watching and listening, maybe who have had some, yeah, just some sparks of curiosity as a result of our conversation? Yeah, 100%. So I uh, just want to pray the end of Psalm 139. Search me, O God, and know me. Test my heart, know my ways. See if there's anything that is concerning or not pleasing to you in our lives and lead us in your everlasting ways. Lord, I pray that for everyone who is listening and watching, that we would come to you with a here I am, Lord, sort of posture. Not a who are you, but a here I am, Lord. And that when we say here I am, Lord, it wouldn't be everything but or everything except, but it would be truly with our 
arms, our hands, our hearts, our minds, our ears, our souls fully open. Here I am, Lord, search me and know me. Would you speak deeply to each and every one who are listening or watching so that we may know that you are the living God. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen, amen. Uh, my favorite verse in all of scripture is Philippians 3.10. For my determined purpose is that I may know Christ and the power of his resurrection. So I guess that's the promised land and the fellowship of his sufferings. That would oh, be the wilderness. So, yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Love that. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for being with us today. I'm honored. Hi, Jonah here. Thank you for being part of the Gospel Spice family. If you've enjoyed this episode, you will love receiving our newsletter. It contains value-packed free gifts and rich content each month. It's at gospelspice.com slash sign up. There is always something new and exciting happening around here, and I don't want you to miss out. Sign up at gospelspice.com slash sign up. Did you know Gospel Spice has a YouTube channel? There's exclusive content there too. So join Gospel Spice on YouTube. Also, please give us a star rating and a comment on your podcast listening app. Your reviews actually really do make a difference to help others discover and experience Gospel Spice. As always, we are praying for you. You can confidentially email us your prayer requests and praise items at the email address contact at gospelspice.com. It's our privilege to pray for you. So, I'll leave you with four things to do. Please pick one and do it at your convenience. One, sign up on our website for our newsletter to receive gifts you're going to love. Two, find us on YouTube and see what content we've put together to help you grow closer to Jesus. Three, rate Gospel Spice on your listening app. It's one of the easiest ways to share the gospel. And finally, four, tell us how we can pray for you. Merci. Merci.